Well, you can expect more wet days in 2025 and more intense monsoon rains. Singapore is experiencing conditions that may get worse during a La Nina event, which could happen as early as this month and last all the way to April. Eugene Chow tells us more. Singapore, like the rest of the world, began 2025 under what's referred to as La Nina-like weather conditions. It's when trade winds over the Pacific Ocean become stronger, pushing warm water further west towards Southeast Asia. That's where it evaporates and forms clouds, which then bring heavier rain over the region. These La Nina-like conditions are expected to subside around April, returning to normal weather conditions up to about June. This cycle of warming and cooling of the tropical Pacific Ocean is known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. It's still too early to predict what will happen to ENSO after June. Specifically for ENSO, predictions after the Northern Hemisphere spring tend to be more uncertain, sometimes termed to be the spring predictability barrier. Regardless, we will have the Southwest monsoon season starting around May and the Northeast monsoon season again starting around November. To examine the impact of such weather patterns, a National University of Singapore research team is working on a tool to identify how vulnerable the Southeast Asia region can be. It looks at events like floods, typhoons and heat waves. What we wanted to do with our uh, framework was to actually provide an almost near real-time tool to extract these impacts and damages. And the way we do it is we use natural language processing techniques uh, an AI to scan thousands of news related to uh, different extreme weather events. The system can pick out specific sentences and data that are relevant to events in different regions. This allows it to establish common themes, such as the potential damage to a city or province. The idea here to provide these vulnerability maps is to uh, complement what is already out there. So government bodies are obviously already aware of some vulnerabilities. Ideally, with our tool, we want to complement that information uh, with, uh, with some granular and crowd sources information from news uh, that uh, is possibly filling some gaps and that were not known by policymakers. The team plans to launch the tool in the next few months. So, just how climate resilient should we be when it comes to infrastructure? For more analysis, we're joined by Associate Professor Tan Teng Hui. He is Dean of the School of Science and Technology at the Singapore University of Social Science, Sciences. Prof Tan, thank you so much for, for joining me today because this is a really important uh, subject. Uh, Singapore has already taken multiple steps uh, to to. Uh, uh, help its infrastructure against climate change issues. We've uh, taken coastal protection. We've raised minimum platform levels for building, deep tunnel sewaging. But it's the extremes that get us, isn't it? It's the La Nina extremes that get us. So what are our vulnerabilities when it comes to infrastructure? Yes, I think the uh, flooding is just one of the extreme uh, mm. consequences of the uh, climate change. We get too much water. As you can see, that it has already affected our transportation, it caused flooding, but critically we need to look at the, the water issue. Mm. The water issue in terms of now we get too much water. It may get a time where you suddenly have a drought, where we don't have enough water to, to make sure that we supply enough for our water supply and the usage. So, so this is something that we need to plan ahead to see to what extent that the climate change can affect the current design that we have, whether they are able to cope with the extreme, uh, new extreme changes in the weather pattern. Yeah, you talked about water, but then you also mentioned wind as a, a particular uh, yes. uh, you know, danger for us, and uh, that quite surprised me. Yes, wind is, again, is because of the climate change. You can have the, the wind forces may change, the direction of wind may change because mm. of the uh, La Nina effect. So again, uh, in all design uh, for, all, for infrastructure, you will have to reevaluate to see whether the parameters that we use in the previous design or existing yes. buildings or the new buildings, whether they need to be reviewed and make changes. Right. So that's my next question. In, in the considerations that we currently have, 
uh, for infrastructure to withstand weather. Where do we need to make those recalibrations? So recalibration, there are, there are two parts. One is for the existing building to mm. see whether the parameters, parameters that have been used, are they still adequate? So we have to review them. And also for new buildings, we need to ensure that we have the new design parameters to ensure that we are able to have uh, more resilient buildings. And there is, that is where we need to look at the design codes. The design code will have to spell out what are the parameters that we need to change. If you look at the statistical records of the rainfall, the wind, uh, wind speed and all that, to check again to see whether the numbers we use for the design needs to be revised. Mm -hmm. Same as for the, uh, the, uh, the new buildings yeah. and also the existing buildings. It's not just construction. It's also to make sure that we are able that, to maintain that. That's my that. question because uh, either the parameters change, uh, some of them are built by the old parameters, so they have to be yes, upgraded. upgraded. Can you give me an example? Examples oh. of, say, for example, uh, say water. You look at the drainage. The drains were designed based on a certain rainfall. So over the years, you can see that the rainfalls are getting more intense. So you need to look at how are we able to cope with the existing drain sizes. So we need to evaluate to see whether there are uh, sufficient uh, uh, sizes to cope for mm. the increase in rainfall and yeah. also because of the urbanization. Yes. Urbanization means that we, we have a lot more concrete structures, ah. concrete surfaces. So the surface runoff is also increased. It doesn't seep into the ground. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one aspect of it. But then the other aspect we also have to look at is the construction methods and materials which we use to, to build these things. You know, are they the ones we use now currently resilient enough for, for the climate change? Uh, and what are some of the new trends, new materials and methods that are emerging? The construction industry has been aware of this uh, climate change issue for quite some time. In fact, uh, Singapore is already moving towards uh, sustainable technologies. Yeah. So the new materials that they are using is basically uh, what they want to reduce the use of, say, concrete and steel. They want to use something like uh, timber. Timber, in a way, is more sustainable because it is, it is a material but that is it has resilient? less embodied. <laughs> uh, not just it's embodied, embodied carbon. Yeah. And also uh, timber and also concrete structures, including timber, they prefer them to be prefabricated. Uh. So the building authority actually uh, recommend or sometimes even stipulate that they have to do prefabrication. Because prefabrication in a way not only provides uh, better material for the future, mm. it also helps to mitigate the climate change. Because when you have prefabrication, you have less wastage mm. because you do everything in the factory. Okay, so it's sustainable and resilient. That, and that's resilient, the part that, yes. Yeah, okay. To make sure that we, we mitigate the, uh, the effect uh, onto the environment. So when it comes to, um, is it going to be difficult, to, you know, all these suggestions that you've put forward to, to, from suggestions to becoming policies? Because, you know, th there's a difference between that. Because I'm wondering whether we should reconsider our planning and our policies as well. For example, uh, fewer concrete structures, more green spaces, you know, like, you know. Yes, I think that policies are important because without policies, people do not have the motivation to change on their own. Mm. Policies sometimes will force them to do in a way that is for the betterment of the country. Mm. So policies like uh, prefabrication, uh, having a more energy efficient uh, uh, equipment, for the building, for example, a building, you take about probably three to four years to have a building completed. But that building will be used for the next maybe 30 years, yeah. 40 years, 50 years. So the cost of operating that building is a lot more compared to the construction cost. Incentive. So incentive. <laughs> so in that sense, you need to have policies yeah. to tell them that you need to use uh, energy efficient uh, uh, plants and equipment and materials understand that. Uh, I appreciate you so much uh, coming by and speaking with us. I've been uh, speaking with uh, Associate Professor uh, Tan Teng Hui, Dean of the School of Science and Technology at SUSS.